Hello everyone and welcome to Archive Viking. Today is the long-awaited seventh video of my Origins of Modern East Asia series. The subject for today's video is the Qing Dynasty of China, China's last imperial dynasty. Specifically, as the title shows, uh, a history of the Qing Dynasty from the Manchu conquest of the Ming to the establishment of what is known as the High Qing Era, or what one could argue is the Golden Age of the Qing Dynasty. <laughs> now, of course, as I always like to point out, I'm sure many of us, uh, when we hear the name China, think of the, or the, hear the name of the country China, think of China as it is today, which is this uh, country here. Uh, and as always, while that is certainly a valid way to think of China, um, it is not the whole picture. Uh, it's not how China always looked. Now, unlike my previous videos mentioning ancient China, this is actually a lot closer <laughs> to how China used to look, but it is still not how China always looked. In order to understand that, we have to go back uh, a little further in time. In order to get that whole picture, we have to go back to uh, a little further in time, uh, starting with the unification of the Jurchens, also known as the Manchus, under the Jurchen Manchu chief Narhachi. So prior to this unification, the Jurchens, also known as Manchus, were a semi-nomadic uh, tribal society that lived in the very aptly named region of East Asia known as Manchuria, which is uh, right around here and also a little around here. And they were divided up into dozens of independent tribes and uh, communities all through that area, some including the uh, the Horchin, uh, the Jalet, the Dorbet, etc., etc., uh, and they had a lot of very close connections with, uh, culturally and uh, politically, with various Mongol groups, such as the uh, Chehar, the Chahar Mongols, uh, the Western Tumed, the Ordos uh, Mongols, as well as others, such as the Buryat and the Oret. Uh, but while they were divided for much of their history, in the early 1600 CE, this began to change with the rise of the church in chief, Nurhachi. Uh, Nurhachi was a powerful church in chief who had, for many years of his life, been the leader of a church in tribe that was uh, a tributary of the Ming Dynasty of China. Uh, and he and his tribe had actually been mercenaries in a variety of main conflicts, both against the Mongols, um, as well as enemies such as the uh, Wako pirates, uh, and briefly uh, fighting against the Japanese during the Imjin War of 1592 to 1598. And also, in, a, in addition to that, uh, as many nomadic tribes in East Asia and Central Asia did during this time period, uh, his tribe also participated in raiding against sedentary societies such as uh, Ming Chinese border towns, as well as Joseon Korean border towns as well. So he had a very well-trained and very experienced mercenary force. And eventually, Nurhachi in 16, uh, 16 CE would be able to uh, convince the Ming to give him permission to essentially form a confederation of Jurchen tribes to deal with other rival Jurchen tribes, i.e. to deal with his enemies. And with this new confederation that you can see here that he formed, he began to defeat the other Jurchen tribes that uh, he saw as his enemies, uh, defeating some, such as the Hara Jurchens, uh, as well as taking uh, various cities, such as the city of Wula, from the Haishi Jurchens. 
uh, eventually over the course of about 10 years, slowly picking off each rival drifting tribe and bringing them into his confederation. And once this war of unification or, or wars of unification were completed, uh, Nurhachi would take it upon himself to establish a dynasty of his own, calling it the Later Jin Dynasty, which you can see here on this map. Um, it's called the Later Jin Dynasty because during the medieval period uh, from the 1100s, really more like the 1000 CEs to the late 1100s CE, uh, there was a Jurchen Empire known as the uh, earlier Jin Dynasty, or the at the time, just the Jin Dynasty, that uh, dominated northern China before being conquered by the Mongols. So, by calling his new dynasty the later Jin Dynasty, he was uh, harkening back to the, glor uh, the glorious past of the Jurchens, um, essentially using sort of um, precedent uh, in order to prove that he was allowed to create his own dynasty. Uh, and once he established this new dynasty, he would take it upon himself to uh, try to, uh, I don't want to say civilize, uh, but he would take it upon himself to make a much more cohesive uh, Jurchen Jin state. Uh, first by adopting the Mongol script, uh, sorry, adapting the Mongol, uh, Mongol script into the Manchu script. Uh, the Mongol script being on the left and the Manchu script being on the right, in order to give the Jurchens, uh, also known as Manchus, um, they were called both various at various points in their history, uh, a form of writing of their own, which they had not had before. The Mongols had, the Uyghurs, another nomadic confederation who we'll talk about later, had, um, and the Han Chinese, of course, had, the Joseon had, uh, the Japanese had, but they had not. So, in order to uh, make a much more cohesive nation, or much more cohesive kingdom, dynasty, what have you, he needed to create his own, the, his nation's own writing system. Uh, he also established what would be know, come known as the Eight Banners, <laughs> which is the, um, the primary military division of the Manchu Jurchen military, where he would take the various um, political entities that he had absorbed in his confederation and divide them up into these eight divisions. One, because it made them much more uh, organized um, and, and much more cohesive, and it was a good way of controlling uh, these new... Uh, conflicting personalities that he had brought into his confederation. He would also go take a step into uh, better training his military by ordering the translation of various Chinese military manuals. Uh, these included, but were not limited to, uh, the uh, six, uh, the various, the uh, the Three Strategies of Shi Gong, um, the Six Secret Teachings on the Way of Strategy, uh, the Art of War, um, and several more. Uh, in other words, making sure that his military uh, had the best training available. And, al and also sort of basing his, ar modeling his army after um, Chinese armies, who were the uh, best fighting force at the time, arguably. After making these reforms, Narhachi would then send what is known as the Seven Grievances to the Ming Dynasty, uh, which were essentially just um, a list of perceived slights uh, that the Ming Dynasty had committed against the Jurchen, uh, whether or not these were real reasons or not. Uh, these were the reasons Narhachi claimed were 
he was declaring war against the Ming Dynasty, uh, with these perceived slights slash grievances being things such as uh, supposedly the Ming killed Nurhachi's father and grandfather without reason. Uh, the Ming would send troops into uh, Jurchen territory to protect some Jurchen tribes such as Yehi against other Jurchen tribes such as Janzo. Um, the Ming supported uh, the Yehi tribes uh, to break its promise to Nurhachi, etc., etc. Uh, and again, whether or not these were things that actually mattered that much to Nurhachi is up for debate, but they were the reasons that he claimed that he was declaring war on the Ming. Uh, and after the, the, the sen, uh, after sending these seven grievances and this declaration of war, Nurhachi would proceed with his newly trained and uh, battle-hardened warriors uh, to defeat the Ming dynasty in several battles, such as the Battle of Zarhu, the Battle of Zhihing, of Zhixing, uh, as well as he would capture the city of Liaoyang uh, in 1621 CE and would make it the capital of his empire until 1625 CE. Uh, however, he would eventually uh, die in battle uh, at the Battle of Ningyuan in 1626 CE. Uh, where he would be succeeded by his son, Pong Taishi, who would rule from 1626 to 1463 CE. And here's Hong Taiji here. Uh, and once taking the throne, Hong Taiji would actually take the reforms that his father Nurhachi uh, implemented and would take them a step further, uh, such as with the adoption of Ming government institutions, such as the Grand Secretariat and the Six Ministries, uh, among others, therefore further modeling um, the later Jin uh, dynasty after the Ming dynasty, even more than Narhachi already had. Uh, and he would also uh, invade Joseon Korea twice, first at the request of uh, Joseon officials, uh, in 1627 CE, uh, this was because there was a dynastic dispute in Joseon Korea happening at the time to, in the Joseon dynasty, and one of these factions asked Hong Taiji for help, and Hong Taiji would answer and would invade the Joseon dynasty, defeat the part, the rival party of the political faction that had asked for his help, uh, and would demand um, that Joseon Korea would become a tributary of the later Jin dynasty. However, this would change uh, in 1636 CE. After Hong Taiji had redubbed the later Jin into the Qing dynasty, uh, and during this time, the Joseon dynasty would actually decide they did not like Qing uh, rule, or Jurchen rule, and would rebel, uh, prompting Hong Taiji to invade Joseon Korea again uh, throughout the course of 1636 to 1637 CE, uh, defeating Joseon, the Joseon military yet again, and would permanently uh, turn Joseon Dynasty Korea into a tributary of the Qing Dynasty. Uh, Hong Taiji would also uh, be it would also continue wars with the Mongol tribes, specifically the Chahar tribe that had been started by his father in 1619, but had been sort of a secondary conflict to the war with the Ming. And uh, so Hong Taiji would continue this conflict and would eventually defeat the Chahars in 1634 CE. Uh, and would absorb the Chahars into his new Qing Empire, as you can see here. Hong Taiji would also, uh, in conjunction with continuing the war um, against the Chahar Mongols, he would also continue the war against the Ming. Uh, actually suffering several defeats at the hand of Ming General Yuang Chonghuan, uh, 
and these defeats were due to the Ming's superior artillery, such as the Hong Yi Pao cannon, which was actually a uh, Dutch and Portuguese cannon uh, that the Ming had begun to adopt and uh, manufacture uh, after contact with European powers. And so, after facing these stark, resounding defeats, thanks to the um, superior artillery of the Ming, uh, Hong Taiji would actually himself purchase uh, dozens or hundreds of cannons from European nations, such as the Portuguese and the Dutch, uh, and would begin to implement the use of these artillery in his own army, uh, starting in 628 CE. During the latter half of his reign, Hong Taiji would also begin to expand into the Amur River Valley of Siberia, where he would conquer the Evniks, a group of Siberian uh, tribesmen who were well known for their hunting skills as well as being reindeer herds, um, ex further expanding his territory and growing his uh, nascent Qing state. Then, towards the end of his reign, the balance of power between his Qing uh, di his Qing dynasty and the Ming dynasty began to shift even further uh, with the defection of various Ma uh, Ming military generals, military leaders, such as Hong Qingzhou, who defected to the Qing after being defeated at the Battle of Songjin in 1642 CE, and bringing with him um, around 50,000 to 100,000 Ming soldiers. Uh, many of whom would have been uh, dressed in these types of uniforms at the time, uh, many of whom were also riflemen, and greatly increasing the military strength of Han Taiji's Qing military. And once the balance in power had shifted thanks to this increase in military power from the defections of Ming generals and Ming soldiers, uh, the conquest of the Ming Dynasty by the Qing Dynasty began to uh, look even more likely. Uh, Hong Taiji, unfortunately, would not live to see this conquest, though. He would die in 1643, with his throne being inherited by his successor, the Shunzi Emperor, who would himself begin, personally, the conquest of the Ming Dynasty. Now, this at first, this was much like what was seen with Han Taishi and Nerhachi. This was still a bit, even with the shift in the balance of power that I mentioned, this was still not, um, this was still not a foregone in conclusion. There were still several very skilled Ming generals, Ming military leaders, uh, along the border who were able to fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with this Qing military machine, this Qing war machine, this Qing superpower, however you want to put it. But this began to shift even more uh, in favor of the Qing with several rebellions. So, as I mentioned in my Ming Dynasty video, at this point in time, the Ming Dynasty was not in great shape. It was suffering famines, wide-scale flooding, uh, massive disease outbreaks, it, an economy collapse, etc., etc. So all of these factors together led to other generals, in addition to uh, the in, in addition to the ones who had already defected, uh, to start a rebellion. Uh, and these rebellions included uh, the Li Zhexing Rebellion which started in 1637 and lasted until 1644 CE, and the Zhang Jiangzhong Rebellion, which started in 1639 and lasted until 1647 CE. Uh, this is the Li Xin Rebellion, and this is uh, Zhang Jiangzhong. Uh, and this, and these rebellions in and of themselves wreaked havoc on the Ming Dynasty's government, uh, essentially weakening uh, the Ming Dynasty to a point that 
it really wasn't in a great position to protect itself, let alone take care of its subjects. Uh, and this, all of these together were even further exacerbated by the defection of yet another Ming general to the Qing dynasty uh, when Wu Sangui, a Ming general who was in charge of the protection of the Shanghai Pass, uh, would defect from the Ming uh, to the Qing in 1644 CE and would actually open the gates of the Great Wall, allowing his uh, allowing his army as well as the Qing army to march down um, and take Beijing. And in fact, part of the reason he defected is because of these rebellions, including Li Xingxin, who himself was sort of uh, trying to declare his own dynasty at this point in time. Um, so, uh, so on top of not already not liking the Ming Dynasty, he was seeing yet another guy whom he didn't like try to set up a dynasty that he probably would have hated even more. So there is that. Uh, and with the capture of Beijing at the hands of Wu Songwei and the Xunzi Emperor's army, uh, the Qing would establish Beijing, the capital of the Ming Dynasty, as their capital as well in 1644 CE. And after taking the you know, after taking Beijing and making it into his capital, as well as uh, beginning the essentially beginning the conquest of the Ming dynasty, uh, the Shunzi Emperor would then reorganize all of the Ming military defectors into what is known as the Green Standard Army. So essentially at this point forward all of the Mongol and Manchu uh, Jurchen soldiers would be divided into the eight banners uh, from the, the original military divisions of the Qing dynasty. Uh, and the Han Chinese and the various other Chinese ethnic groups would be divided into the Green Standard Army, uh, where their uniforms would be generally like, generally like this. Um, and I'll get in a little more later in the video into sort of what those differences between the different groups look like, uh, but this is generally how the Ming army, the Qing army, sorry, uh, the Qing army would operate, uh, from this point forward. The Shunzi emperor would also order that, would also declare that all Chinese men must shave their head, um, and braid what was the... Uh, Sh yeah, shave their forehead and braid what's left of their hair into what is known as a Q, uh, a Q braid identical to those of the Manchus, which, for those of you wondering, a Q is essentially this very long braid that you see here, where you shave most of the head except for the very, uh, for the back of it, um, and you, you know, shave the forehead and what's left, and you fold as much of the hair as you can backwards into this braid, um, letting it grow out and braiding it into this long braid that you see here. Um, with all of this done, the Shunzi Emperor would begin to um, march, uh, send his army further into the Ming Empire to continue the conquest. Uh, and this conquest could be very brutal at times, uh, with various massacres happening, such as the uh, Yangzhou Massacre, which is a massacre that's particularly well known for its brutality, because the Ming officers who had defected, as well as the Qing military, um, who slaughtered thousands of the city's inhabitants because they would not submit to Qing rule. Uh, however, it should also be noted that this was not uh, a uh, like single conquest event. This conquest took decades uh, with the various Ming generals uh, dividing up and sort of creating their own uh, city-state, empires, dynasties, um, each declaring themselves as the uh, successor to the Ming Dynasty, as well as the several of the princes of the Ming Dynasty also creating their own Ming rump states, um, including the Southern Ming. So, like I said, it was a very long, drawn-out uh, conquest that, again, was not necessarily a foregone conclusion. Uh, here's sort of more of the military expeditions uh, into the southern uh, Chinese territories. 
Uh, however, as as was pretty much endemic uh, at the beginning of the conquest and a little bit before the conquest, uh, several Ming generals would continue to defect from uh, their dynasty, uh, from the southern Ming dynasty. Uh, one such example is the Ming admiral Zheng Zilong, who would betray the Ming loyalists in 1646 CE. Uh, and he was a very skilled naval leader. In fact, he had at one point in time even been a pirate. Uh, so he was very, he knew how to lead naval battles very well. And so he sort of became just yet another skilled tool in the uh, Qing Manchu playbook. Uh, <clears throat> while all this conquest was going on, though, uh, Shunzi would begin to sort of make a lot of reforms or, or create a lot of reforms for his uh, newly conquered China. Uh, first of all, he would reestablish the civil service examinations, the sort of examinations that um, could lead men uh, to higher ranks in society uh, in 1646 CE. Uh, he also reestablished the uh, tribute trade network, uh, which, uh, as I've said in other videos about uh, Chinese empires, the tributary trade network was a network of what are called tributary states who would send a, a variety of goods to the Chinese empire, uh, to the Chinese emperor specifically, to... Um, show their acknowledgement that they were uh, that they were the I don't want to say property but they were under the purview they were under the hegemony of the Chinese Empire uh, these nations included the kingdom of Ryuk uh, in modern day Okinawa and the various islands around it uh, the various uh, Vietnamese kingdoms uh, such as Anam um, Champa Myogen etc etc uh, various other uh, Central Asian states, such as the Mongol successor state, Mughalistan, not to be mistaken for the Mughal Empire. Uh, they are two different things. Uh, of course, Tibet, uh, as well as European colonies, such as the Spanish colony of Manila. Meanwhile, while all of these... Uh, while his father had defected and while Shenzi was reestablishing these institutions and making these reforms, Zheng Zilong's uh, son, Zheng Shengkong, also known as Ko Zheng uh, would actually continue to resist the Qing dynasty. Uh, and he would do this in a variety of ways. First, he would actually go on to conquer the island of Taiwan, specifically laying siege to the Dutch uh, colony of Zealandia, and would take it in, uh, I believe, uh, yeah, 1661. Uh, and he would go on after this to create a powerful maritime empire uh, that held quite a lot of sway over the South China coast, with the red areas on this map being areas of his direct control, and the pinkish areas being areas of uh, indirect control. And in fact, let's see here. Yeah. And in fact, uh, Kozingo's empire, maritime empire, was so powerful that it was actually able to become a threat to European powers. I mean, of course, the Dutch, whom he had conquered the city from, but also the Spanish. He had actually make, uh, made a plan to conquer Span the Spanish Philippines. Uh, something that actually sent the Spanish running. The Spanish stopped all uh, military campaigns that they were conducting in the Philippines and withdrew their forces to Manila. And in fact, Spanish, uh, Spanish strategists, uh, Sp uh, Chinese strategists, and many historians, uh, such as Tony Andre, uh, are pretty sure that Kozinga would have actually succeeded in that conquest. Um, so he was very much a force to be reckoned with, much like the Ming Dynasty was uh, at their height, because they too also were a threat to European powers, um, and was very much, if not necessarily the equal of the Qing Dynasty at the time, very close to the equal of the Qing Dynasty. 
uh, Shunzi would continue his uh, reforms by converting to Chan Buddhism in 1657 CE, uh, essentially patronizing the Buddhist religion, specifically the Chinese, uh, sorry, East Asian branch of Buddhism. Uh, with Chan Buddhism being uh, the predominant form of Buddhism in China, uh, Korea, the Koreas, and uh, Japan. He would also go on to reestablish the Han Lin Academy, uh, where individuals, specifically males, could go to study for the examinations as well as study for a variety of other uh, civil uh, positions. Um, it, it, it was essentially a university, a, a, high, a form of higher education that men could go to in the Qing Dynasty. So while the Ming loyalists were the primary military concern of the Shunzi Emperor's reign, they were not the only uh, enemy that the Qing military would face during his reign. In fact, during both his reign and his, and his successor Kong Zi's reigns, there would be on and off again warfare between the Qing Dynasty and the Tsardom of Russia, with these wars starting in 1652 and ending in 1689 CE. Uh, now, I've already done a dedicated video to this, which I will include in the iCard, but these wars uh, culminated in of several... Uh, strategic victories uh, by the Qing dynasty with the culmination of this being the uh, Qing victory in the siege of Osman, Osman being the um, Russian base of operations in Siberia, and the end result being the Qing annexation of uh, parts of Siberia that you see here uh, in yellow. So you see this red line denotes the uh, partition between the Tsardom of Russia and the Qing Dynasty. So everything below this red line, uh, which now lies in modern-day Russia, uh, at the time was uh, now part of the Qing Dynasty. Uh, however, the Shunzi Emperor would eventually die. He would actually die of smallpox because the Manchus, the Jurchens, had not actually run into smallpox. Smallpox was more endemic in areas like Japan and Korea and China and, of course, the Americas and Europe and such. Not in, sorry, not endemic in the Americas, uh, more endemic in Europe and such, uh, but not in Manchuria. And he would be succeeded by uh, his son, uh, who would become known as the Kangxi Emperor, and he would rule the longest of any of the Qing emperors from 1661 to 1722 CE. And here's the Kangxi Emperor here. Uh, and the Kangxi Emperor's, one of, some of his first actions upon taking the throne would be to uh, actually continue his father's reforms uh, by establishing the Sacred Edict, which is actually an improvement uh, of an, an update of uh, edicts that had been declared by the Shunzi Emperor. Uh, the Kangxi Emperor would also uh, allow for a time Jesuit missions, uh, Jesuit Christian missions into China, um, hearing out, hear, hearing them out, actually for a time considering converting to Christianity. However, um, the Pope. Uh, he and the Pope sort of butted heads. Uh, uh, the Pope sort of wanted more authority uh, in Asia than uh, the Kangxi Emperor wanted him to have. And so this butting of heads eventually led to the ban of Christians from China uh, in 1715 CE. And the Kangxi Emperor, of course, would continue his father's uh, campaigns against the Southern Ming loyalists, making actually great strides and actually coming very close to conquering uh, all of so uh, Southern China. However, this these uh, this progress would face um, a large setback thanks to what is known as the Revolt of the Three Fudatories, which lasted from 1673 to 1681 CE. 
So, what this essentially was is as the Qing military began to uh, uh, peer, you know, began to plunge deep into South China territory, uh, the Qing government, the Shunzi Emperor, would bestow upon uh, the three Ming generals who, Ming defectors who had helped the Qing military. Uh, the, the the Qing military campaigns the most, uh, he would give them each their own sort of, uh, their own province to govern over. They're essentially their own city-states. And these generals would be Wu Sang Wei, the general who had opened the, uh, the Great Wall's gates in order to allow for the uh, Qing military to march on to Beijing. Uh, he would also, the Shenzhi would also give uh, territories to Ming generals Shang Keiji and Shang Zhijian. And for much of the Qing uh, conquest of South China, these generals would be loyal to the Shunzi Emperor and the Qing dynasty. However, eventually, they began to decide, well, we have our own city-states. <laughs> You know, why don't we create our own dynasties? Because of course they would, because that's what every other uh, Ming defector and Ming warlord had done as the Ming dynasty was falling around them, tried to create their own dynasties. And so that's what they did. They started this war that would last for nearly a decade. And the fighting in this war was incredibly, it was incredibly brutal and hard fought. Uh, eventually, the Qing would come out on top, though, with uh, the Kangxi Emperor eventually, over the course of the decade, conquering all three of the feudatories, um, the three feudatories being Kunming, uh, Guangzhou, and Fuzhou, uh, with Fuzhou falling first, followed by Guangzhou, and of course, the last one being Kunming, because Wu Songwei was the most powerful of the three. In addition to the revolt of the three feudatories, uh, the Qing military would also begin to wage a pro uh, prolonged war uh, against the Jing dynasty of Taiwan, uh, the dynasty created by Kuzing Ha. Um, and this happened because of the defection of an admiral who had once been under the service of the Jing family, Xi, Xi, uh, Xi Long, who would defect to the Qing military because essentially he was his political influence began to be viewed as a threat at the, uh, by the Jing family and the court in Taiwan. So he would, under this political strife, would defect to the Qing government, bring with him his navy. And once he did that, he would be given permission by Kongzi to begin this protracted campaign lasting from 1668 to actually 1683. It says 1681, but I, I meant 1683 CE, uh, with this ca uh, campaign culminating in the conquest of uh, Taiwan at the Battle of Peng Hu. Once the three feudatories had been put down, once the revolt had been put down, and once Taiwan and the Ming loyalists had been conquered, the Kongzi Emperor could focus his attentions onto other military campaigns. Uh, specifically, his campaigns against the Zunglar Hanate, uh, a Mongol successor state to the Mongol Empire, with these campaigns lasting from 1687 to 1697 CE. <clears throat> For much of their early history, though, Galdan and Kangzi, uh, Galdan Han, the leader of the Zunger Hanate, and, uh, and Kangzi would be relatively neutral of each other. With neither really wanting to ruffer, ruffle each other's feathers. Galdan didn't want to ruffle the feathers of Kangzi because he was very aware of the threat that the Ming, the, sorry, that the Qing military machine posed to the survival of his, of his Hanate, of his confederation. And the Kangzi emperor did not want to uh, fight a three-way war. Essentially, what I mean by that is he, he didn't want to have to fight the Zunglar Hanate while also having to fight Taiwan and the Ming Loyalists and the Three Feudatories. 
So really a four-way war. Uh, but once these campaigns, as I said a couple of minutes ago, were concluded, the Kongs Emperor could now uh, now had time to conduct campaigns against Galdan. And this happened specifically because the Kalka Mongols, uh, over as you can see here, specifically requested help from the Qing Dynasty in a war that they were already in against the Zungar Hanate, uh, against Galan Han. And so now with this, um, now now with the precedent, now with the actual reason that he had been waiting for to wage war against Galvan Han had presented himself, presented itself, and the Kongzi Emperor would personally lead these campaigns, uh, here's the Kongzi Emperor here, uh, against the Zungar Hanate, defeating the Zungar Hanate in several different battles, uh, eventually resulting in Galvan's death at the Battle of Jamadal. Now, I already did a dedicated video to the Zungar Hanate, specifically to the Mongol successor states of uh, the Mongol Empire in East Asia, uh, my Northern Yuan video, uh, and in it I said that Galvan died of old age. That was a mistake on my part. He actually died in battle at Jamadao. Now, we're not sure, at uh, Jamadao, we're not sure if he specifically died in the battle or if while he was retreating, he was killed by his various generals. But either way, he died as a result of these battles with the Kongzi Emperor. While the Kongzi Emperor most certainly focused and spent much of his time on campaign uh, and military campaigns, this was not his only focus. In fact, during his reign, the Kongzi Emperor would commission the uh, would commission the creation of a variety of different um, bureaucratical and liter uh, literary works, uh, such as the uh, Quan Tong Shi, or also known as the Kangzi. Uh, so the Kuang Tong Shi, uh, the Kangji Dictionary, and the History of the Ming Dynasty, which was actually first started by his father, the Shunzi Emperor. However, he, during his reign, most of the work on, on this uh, manuscript was completed, but it was still not finished by the time of his death. But it still shows that he spent a lot of time on literary and academic pursuits as well. Uh, then in 1720 CE, uh, the Zungar Hanate would again rear its head, uh, <laughs> and would actually invade Tibet, leading the, uh, Tibetan capital of Lhasa, uh, and the Dalai Lama to request for help from the Qing military. And so... Kong's Emperor would again personally lead the Qing military into Tibet, would defeat the Zungar Hanate, and would annex Tibet into the Qing Empire. Eventually, the Kong's Emperor would die of old age, though, of course, uh, and he would be succeeded by his son, the Yongzheng Emperor, who would only rule for about... Uh, uh, for a little over a decade, from 1722 to 1735 CE. And here is the Yingzhong Emperor here. One of the most striking legacies of his reign would be his declaration of anti-Christian and anti-Muslim laws in 1724 and 1729 CE, respectively wherein he would uh, ban Christianity and Islam and would persecute both Christians and Muslims. Now, these laws would not be as uh, stark or brutal as, say, uh, the anti-Christian laws put in place by the Tokugawa shogunate in Japan, but they would be pretty close. <laughs> also, early on in his reign, uh, the Yingzhong Emperor would have to reestablish rule over Tibet uh, because during in 1728 a rebellion broke out in Tibet between two rival factions uh, with one faction supporting the Zungar Hanate and the other faction supporting the Qing Dynasty 
And so this prompted the, the Yongzhong Emperor to send in military forces to quell this rebellion and reassert dominance over Tibet. Though the, he would also face quite a lot of military drawbacks, specifically and specifically at the hands of uh, Galdan Han's son, Soong Rabatan, who would defeat several Qing military expeditions into Zungar territory, uh, especially in 1729 CE. Uh, this is a coin uh, with Soong Rabatan's name on it, with his sort of uh, sigil on it. Uh, but despite these military setbacks and despite having to quell rebellion and despite his brutal anti-Christian and anti-Muslim laws, Young Zhang Emperor would actually also try to make some beneficial reforms. First, he would start by attempting to make civil service exams accessible to all ethnic groups within the Qing Empire. Previously, they were only accessible to Han Chinese, uh, Manchus, and Mongols, but he would but during this point in time, he would actually try to expand that to include other ethnic groups such as the Don uh, slash Tonka, uh, the Hakka, uh, the Miao, and other groups whom I'll talk about later on in the video. Uh, but his reign would be short-lived uh, as he would die, like I said, after only a little over a decade, uh, and would be succeeded by his son, Qian Long, who would rule for almost as long as his grandfather, Kong Zi, from 1735 to 1796 CE. And here is the Qian Emperor. Uh, and during this time, uh, Qin, uh, the Qian Long would order the compilation of the Siku Quan Chi, uh, a group of Tang Dynasty and Song Dynasty poems. Uh, into a consolidated book. Um, he would be a patron of the arts throughout his reign. Uh, he would also order the construction of various gardens, such as the uh, the Zhang Lo Garden uh, that you can see here. Uh, here's the design, and here's like one of the mazes that is in it that actually took about 40 years to construct from 1747 to 1783 CE. But despite being a patron of the arts, the Qianlong Emperor would also order the destruction of any literature he deemed anti Qing, uh, especially in the latter half of his reign from 1772 to 1793 CE starkly mirroring the uh, book burnings that were conducted by the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huangdi, during the 200s BCE. Uh, in fact, that's what this image is from, uh, but it's still a good way of showing sort of what Qianlong was doing. He would also implement anti-gun measures uh, in 1750 and 1781 CE. Uh, and these two, these two anti-gun measures were actually conducted for uh, two varying different reasons. The first was uh, ordering uh, the confiscation of guns from the ethnic uh, Solon peoples of Siberia. Uh, the Solon peoples are actually a subgroup of the ethnics. Uh, again, here's sort of what they look like. Uh, and this was done, you can pause to read, but uh, the, essentially the gist is this was done because the Qianlong Emperor felt that the Solons and Evniks were le were too uh, willingly leaving behind the old ways. He felt that uh, Siberian and Mongolian and Manchu tribesmen uh, shouldn't use guns. He felt they should focus more on traditional skills such as, arch uh, such as archery and horseback riding and things like that. Uh, and this specifically came about because the Solons and the, uh, the Evniks um, were using guns and hunting, uh, and he felt that that was, again, uh, too willingly moving away from tradition, and that hunting should be conducted with archery and horsemanship. And so he ordered all guns of the Evniks to be confiscated. Uh, but he would also order that 
each Evnik would be given one tail of seal uh, of silver, uh, for in, in return for each gun that was confiscated from them. Uh, and there's a, a continuation of that uh, sort of mindset that he had behind confiscating the guns. And again, as you can see at the end, he specifically was he was also worried about uh, the integrity of the Imperial Guardsmen, because he again felt that the Imperial Guardsmen, who were predominantly made up of Siberian and Central Asian makeup, uh, Mongols, Manchus, uh, and Edniks, and various others, that he felt that they should focus on archery and horsemanship, while the Han Chinese were the ones who should focus on using guns. Uh, and then he would propose yet another uh, institute, yet another ban uh, during the 1770s and 1780s. First, hearing about, uh, hearing it as a suggestion from a, a Qing general, uh, Xu Heidi, who actually proposed the idea of a gun ban to Chen Long after he suppressed uh, an uprising, actually, the Chen Long. Emperor's reign would be would have would uprisings during his reign would actually be very commonplace. But during the Wang Long Rebellion, uh, Shu Heidi noticed that this rebellion was more difficult to put down because the Han Chinese had possession of guns, uh, and so he suggested that we should make owning of guns, what he calls bird guns, uh, illegal and only uh, make it to where only the military could have access to guns. And so, taking this suggestion at heart, in 1781 CE, the Qianlong would actually agree and would uh, create this edict forbidding the manufacture of these guns, uh, saying that owning guns was prohibited to civilians, um, and ordering anyone who manufactures uh, uh, these guns to stop the manufacturing and ordering actually the investigation of these artisans. And also ordering commanders to report all cases of gun use by civilians to the emperor annually. The biggest legacy of the Qianlong Emperor's reign, however, were what were known as the Ten Great Campaigns, which he started in 1752 and ended in 1792 CE. The first and second of which were the uh, final campaigns against the Zungar Hanids, uh, with the first Zungar campaign ending in the conquest of the Zungar Hanids. However, uh, the, uh, this would not last very long because the the following year after this successful campaign, uh, the a Zungor, uh, a Zungor Han, a Zungor war leader by the name of Armar Sorna would actually start a rebellion uh, that would last from 1756 to 1758, ending in Armar Sorna uh, dying in exile and, and ending in the wholesale genocide of the Zungar Mongol people that you can see here on the right. Uh, and as I said just a few minutes ago, rebellions during Qianlong's reign would actually be commonplace uh, because in, in conjunction with the second Zungar campaign, uh, Qianlong would ha order his military to put down the revolt of the uh, Alistar Kojas uh, in uh, southwestern China, going from 1757 to 1759 CE. Uh, he would also uh, campaign against uh, rebellions going on in Chen Chuan, uh, China. Uh, from 1747 to 1749 uh, and 1771 to 1776 CE, uh, putting down these rebellions. Uh, he would also uh, order campaigns, order military invasions or military operations conducted against uh, the the Kingdom of Burma in the Sino-Burmese uh, Sino War. Uh, from 1765 to 1790 CE, uh, uh, culminating in several battles 
uh, with some victories uh, uh, won by the Qing military, some victories won by the Burmese military, and really no one getting the upper hand and both sides really claiming victory. But despite the sort of uh, inconclusive conflict, the Qing would at, would still be able to gain some of my, would it, would still be able to obtain minor land gains during this war. Uh, and then also later on, uh, after these campaigns and in conjunction with the Burmese War, he would have to put down yet another rebellion uh, in the Li uh, Shuang Wen Rebellion, which went from 1786 to 1788 CE. Uh, he would also conduct military operations against uh, Nepal, which again led to inconclusive results with both sides uh, claiming victory, uh, though it seems that the Qing Dynasty military won most initial campaigns, uh, with the Qing military only withdrawing after suffering both disease and guerrilla warfare. But again, that's still relatively inconclusive. Uh, and there were no territorial gains achieved from this war. And then the biggest failure of the Tin Campaigns was the campaign by the Qing military in uh, Dai Viet, or modern day Vietnam. And this was done very similar to going all the way back to the initial uh, uh, Qing invasions of Joseon, Korea. This was done during the time of the civil war going on in uh, Dai Viet, also known as Annam at the time, where one side uh, asked for help against their rival, the Taesan family. And so the Qing, uh, so Qian Long would send the Qing military to help this faction against the Taesan faction, only to be ambushed at literally every turn, suffering heavy casualties, leading the Qing military to retreat back into uh back into the Qing dynasty. Now, it's important to note that uh, the Qing military at the time was one of the most powerful militaries in the world. Uh, after all, they defeated Russia, and they defeated uh, Taiwan, which in itself was a powerful maritime empire that could rival the Spanish Empire and things like that. But it's also important to note that even the other, those European empires like Britain and Spain and such also faced revolts uh, and also faced military setbacks in their campaigns as well. Um, so there is that. With all that being said, uh, eventually the Qing campaigns would conclude, would conclude. And with the conclusion of these campaigns, China would be the largest it had ever been. And actually would be would look very similar to what it does today. Uh, only it would even would, and it's already pretty large as it is today. It's actually larger than my country, the U.S. Um, <clears throat> but it was even larger at that point in time, because in addition to the territory that we consider modern day China now, it also held parts of uh, what is now uh, Myanmar, I believe, uh, Burma, as well as parts of Siberia. Uh, you could include the Joseon Dynasty Korea in there, after all it was a tributary state, as well as Mongolia, making it an incredibly large empire, actually larger than most of the European empires at the time. Uh, speaking of the European empires, <laughs> uh, China was actually during it was actually in contact with these European nation states during this period of time. They would actually trade with these empires such as the British Empire and Spanish Empire and such. Uh, but it was relatively one-sided to a point. Um, the Qing Dynasty really only wanted trade conducted in a single port. And, and it wasn't and this wasn't exclusive to Britain. It was all of their tributary states. Each tributary kingdom had to trade in a specific port. They they liked that division. So like say Japan in one port way up here, uh, Korea in another port here, uh, Ryuk in another port here, etc. etc. But Britain didn't like this uh, didn't like this agreement. And so the British East India Company actually sent uh, an individual by the name of McCartney, uh, along with an embassy, to the Qianlong uh, court, to the Qing court, 
in 1793 CE, essentially asking for more ports to be opened for the British East India Company and asking for more favorable trade uh, concessions, more favorable trade for the British East India Company. But the Qianlong Emperor said no. In fact, he said, no, that's not how this works. He's, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he was like, you, you, we, say that we really have nothing we want from you. You come here for what we have. I'm not going to give you any more concessions. That's not how this works. You obey me. We are the center of the universe. We are the middle kingdom. Deal with it. Uh, and at the point, and at that, and at that point in time, the Qing Empire was very much, um, it, it was very much on the level of the British Empire. Maybe just slightly less technologically advanced because um, they, because Britain at this point in time was under its industrial revolution, uh, and Qing China was not. But that, like, but that division was only so slightly. And arguably, at this point in time, the Qing Empire was more powerful than the British Empire. Uh, especially considering that this was after the British Empire had had uh, suffered heavy casualties during the. And this brings us to the next section of the video, which is the high the, the section of the video where I talk about the High Qing era, or the essentially the golden age of the Qing Dynasty, which lasted from uh, the reign of the Kangxi Emperor. Uh, through uh, Qianlong Emperor and his successor's reigns, uh, being a very uh, prosperous time period for the Qing Dynasty. First, we're going to look at their army and their navy. So as I said, uh, the Qing military was a very powerful military that was most certainly a gunpowder army. Uh, they had soldiers who made use of muskets as well as artillery that they uh, adopted from both China and European powers. And they were also a very diverse military, with the military being made up predominantly of Han Chinese, Mongols, and Manchu slash Jurchen uh, ethnic groups with the Han Chinese being generally divided up into the, uh, the Green Standard Army, where they would be predominantly infantry who focused on things like gunpowder weapons like rifles, while the Mongols and the Manchus slash Jurchens would be predominantly horse cavalry, uh, horse archers, who would be divided into the eight banners. Uh, and all of these group, all three of these groups could become officers, but predominantly the the main people who would uh, be officers in the military would be those of the Manchus, though Han Chinese and Mongols also could become officers. In fact, this diversity of ethnic groups in the military can be seen in the various generals who led the Qing forces during uh, Qianlong's Ting campaigns, with two of his best generals being the Manchu general Ma Chong, here on the left, and the Mongol general Ayushi, here on the right, both of which led very successful campaigns and won several uh, very high strategic victories for the Qing military during this period of time. And the Qing Dynasty also had a very sophisticated navy on its hands. Now, until recently in modern scholarship, the Qing Dynasty has been known predominantly as a continental empire, very similar to, say, how the U.S. was before the 1900s. But this is not this this couldn't be farther from the truth. The Qing Dynasty was actually not just a continental empire; it was definitely a maritime empire as well. It had several large fleets that it had developed to protect its coast and to and to battle uh, maritime powers such as Taiwan, the very powerful Zheng family's empire, maritime empire in Taiwan. In fact, here is one: the Fujian fleet uh, that you can see here. The, and the, the Qing had a very, what a very developed conception of how, uh, a very developed view of the sea. They would actually divide the ocean into 
ocean regions such as the Eastern Sea, the, South, the Southeastern Ocean, all the way down to the Great Western Ocean. And they even had different strategies for how to protect, uh, how to better, how to best defend the empire for different types of uh, seawaters and waterways. Whereas, like, say, waters between two isles, you know, you could use to obstruct enemies. Waters where sailors found it most favorable, you could uh, to pass through. You could garrison. Um, X and entrance currents could be uh, the best locations to construct forts, etc., etc. Uh, and these fleets that they built had designated patrol areas that were very large in territory. Um, this is the uh, patrol limit of the Dingzhou Navy that you see here. And as you can see, it covers a large area of the China coast. Uh, and, and they also had several dedicated ship construction, uh, I don't know if you would call it factories, but workshops. They had workshops that were dedicated to building their fleet. Uh, so again, despite this misconception that the Qing Dynasty was only a continental empire, uh, the Qing Dynasty very much did have a well-developed and advanced navy. Again, that was maybe only slightly less advanced than the British, but still advanced enough that they could definitely hold their own against any European power. Uh, now we move on to what the government sort of looked like during this time period. So, on paper, the Qing Dynasty had a strict sort of pyramid of uh, social class, with the emperor being on top, government officials being just below, the nobles all the way down to slaves at the bottom. However, as always, things are much more complicated. Uh, the uh, Qing government was actually divided uh, into a variety of different uh, organizations, such as uh, the six ministries, where you have things like the Board of Civil Appointments, uh, the Board of Works, the Board of War, etc., etc. Uh, you had the Grand Council, and then you had various other lower military, sorry, lower, lower bureaucratic levels, such as the Governor General, um, Governor and Military Official, uh, and other government, official, government officials. So Governor General, who was in charge of all the governors, and then uh, you had various other governors who were in charge of a single province, in a province, and then within these provinces you had various uh, tax collectors, magistrates who were in charge of, say, like what we would call a county uh, or town, ships, etc., uh, as well as people to manage building projects. And then, of course, at the bottom was the people. Uh, and again, here's sort of the look at the various ranks within the, uh, e this is specifically within the women within the court, with the empress being on top and the various different concubines and uh, consorts and such throughout. So again, the Qing government was a very complex, uh, very well organized governmental body. Of course, the backbone of this very well developed Qing bureaucracy were the high, the literati of the High Qing Dynasty, specifically the scholars and uh, aristocrats. So, in order to become a member of the High Qing literati, which was only open to men, you would have to uh, pass one of these silver service examinations. Uh, and once you did, you would then become one of the literati, as you see here. However, uh, there were also several different layers of these examinations, with each layer becoming increasingly more difficult. So, for example, the county, uh, the county prefecture examination would be, say, uh, you, one in ten people passed, and all the way up to the advanced scholar level, which would, say, be like, I don't know, I'm spitballing, I don't know the, the number off the top of my head, but it would be like, around 1 in 10,000 people passing. One of the best examples of how difficult it was to pass these examinations is the literati Xin Fu. Xin Fu being a Hai Ching literati who only passed the first two levels of examination and couldn't get past that, uh, but he still had a 
a beautiful career as a member uh, of the literati. He would actually write several books, his most famous of which is the Six Records of a Floating Life, which would talk about his day-to-day -day life with his wife. Um, and his relationship with his wife seems to have been rather unusual for the time because he and his wife seem to have both been deeply in love with each other and he seems to have viewed his wife, in fact he outright states he views his wife as an equal in how he wishes that Qing cultural norms, the Chinese cultural norms, would change and allow him and his wife to be seen as equals by Chinese society as a whole rather than just amongst themselves. Which actually brings me to my next section of the video, Women in the Qing Dynasty. Now, very similar to most Chinese dynasties, women in the Qing Dynasty would be considered second-class citizens or subservient to men. Uh, though, of course, there were varying degrees of this, uh, with, uh, with Qing uh, Manchu noblewomen holding a lot more authority uh, and having a lot more freedom than those who were not in the, uh, who were not nobles. Uh, and of course, they had much more expensive outfits they could, um, that they had available to them. Meanwhile, Han Chinese, uh, Han Chinese women, uh, who often were very wealthy in their own right, um, dressed in outfits very similar to this. And in fact, the higher ranking members of the Han Chinese, uh, uh, citizens of the Qing Dynasty would actually have their women uh, perform what is known as foot binding, where you would, at a very young age, you would have your daughter's feet bound in ropes and cords until they shrunk down to a very small size, which they saw as aesthetically pleasing to uh, to men. Um, and in fact, it was incredibly difficult for women to get a husband if they did not have bound feet. Now, of course, the lower ranking members of Qing Dynasty society, the lower ranking members of Han Chinese ethnic groups, as well as other ethnic groups, did not bind their feet because oftentimes they say were farmers or uh, other things like that that required them to have normal shaped feet. And the traditional duties of women in the Qing Dynasty would be things such as, for the lower classes of Qing society, uh, weaving uh, silk and cloth textiles uh, into uh, silk and cloth threads into textiles, uh, into sheets of fabric and things like that, while the higher ranking uh, Qing women would do things like embroidery, make beautiful embroidered designs into cloth. But by far, the primary function, uh, the primary duty of women in the Qing dynasty was the education of the household's children, uh, meaning that they were incredibly literate, which was not uncommon during this period of time across the world, but it was even more prominent in the Qing Dynasty because women would be especially uh, would 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 be especially responsible for educating their sons in things like, say, the Confucian classics for when they go off to take the civil service examinations. Mm. And then when it came to it comes to educating the women in the household, uh, the girls in the household, the mothers would educate their daughters on, of course, the Confucian classics and other things they would need to educate their sons on eventually. Uh, but also they would teach them how to paint, various forms of etiquette for, say, marriage ceremonies and things like that. As well as they would teach their uh, their daughters how to read, write, and compose poetry. Uh, in fact, there were several treatises that were composed by women, uh, treatises of poetry that were composed by women during the High Chain, uh, such as this treatise here in the center that was composed by uh, Zhang uh, Lungying. In fact, there were quite a lot of female poets during both the Ming and the Qing dynasties. 
Uh, and you can see here, this is sort of just the distribution of them uh, in uh, the sort of regional distributions of female poets in the Qing and Ming dynasties. Um, here are the various other geographic uh, areas and, dis and distributions there. Uh, and in fact, many of them often work together. As you can see here, these are lines connecting uh, literary relationships among female authors of different regions. So they were very well connected and did collaborate often. However, this does not mean that this, these were not the only professions women could have. Uh, in fact, one of the most prominent professions in the Qing Dynasty and in the Ming Dynasty was that of being a prostitute or a courtesan, uh, which you can see in these two images here. Uh, with courtesanship actually being very prominent in the early Qing court before Qianlong Emperor began to view it as sort of a moral failing and he and his officials began to crack down on it, banning the practice of courtesanship in the Qing aristocracy. <laughs> but this actually backfired uh, because it led to these courtesans and prostitutes now being forced to uh, apply their profession in the public sector, uh, and actually, it, which actually led to more and more brothels being opened up in the Qing dynasty. And this was for a variety of reasons. Uh, some women went into prostitution ship, uh, into courtesan ship, uh, because they saw it as a way to gain more freedom. And they were like, well, we don't want to be wives, we don't want to be constrained by the strict Qing societal norms, so we're going to go become a prostitute, a courtesan, and we'll gain more freedom. But some were went through this profession under much, uh, under much hardship. Uh, some were actually kidnapped and trafficked into this profession as slaves. Others went into this profession because they were suffering financial hardships. Others were sold into this profession because their family was suffering financial hardships. So while it could certainly be an avenue of much more freedom for Qing women, it was also an avenue of much hardship and strife for Qing women as well. Now we need to look at the other side of this coin, men in the Qing dynasty. So men in the Qing dynasty also had strict guidelines they had to face. Of course, there's the aforementioned queue that they had to wear, which was uh, the uh, tor uh, tonsured head and queue, where they would shave most of their head and the rest of the hair would be braided into the queue uh, and things like that. Um, and it was a sign of, um, of essentially social control under the Manchu Qing government. And if you cut your hair or you... Uh, or anything like that, uh, or you had full hair, you would actually could be executed. Uh, and the men in the Qing Dynasty actually had four primary avenues of profession that they could go into, uh, the, with these four professions being either being a farmer, um, the most sought after profession, that being of a Qing Dynasty official, where you could have a lot of uh, authority and prestige and wealth, uh, but you could also go into uh, craft work, like you could be an artisan, uh, like say a potter or a mason, or you could go and be a miner where you mine things, etc., uh, etc., et or of course you could go into the military as you see here. Uh, so now, for now, we're going to move away from the social aspects of the Hai Qing era, and we're going to take a look at the literary aspect of the Qing Dynasty. So during the Qing Dynasty, literature and literary works actually flourished uh, with a variety of, Han, of uh, Qing literati writing them, uh, with two of the most famous being Yuan Mei on the left and Ji Jia Lan, also known as Ji Yun, on the the right, <laughs> with Yuan Mei publishing the Zi Bu Yu, or what the master would not discuss, and Ji Yun, or Ji uh, Jian Lun, uh, publishing the Shadow Book, 
both of which were collections of supernatural stories and occult knowledge. And in fact, as I mentioned in my video on vampire hunters in uh, throughout the world, throughout world history, uh, I mentioned these books. And in these books, Yuan Mei and Ji Jian Lun actually talk about how to kill the Jiang Qi or the Chinese version of the vampire. There were also other literary works that were uh, published or compiled during this period of time with uh, literary works being published such as The Carnal Mat a Prayer Mat by the Yu and then other earlier texts from the Ming Dynasty uh, being republished and reconsolidated such as the Jinping Mei, uh, also known as the Wild Horse and Literature. Uh, it was also during this period of time that earlier literary works were became in, increasingly more popular, um, and they had already been more popular, had been popular, but they were increasingly popular. And these were uh, main dynasty novels such as *The Journey to the West* uh, and *The Water Margin* and *The Romance of the Three Kingdoms*, the three most popular novels of the Ming Dynasty, which were just as popular in the Qing Dynasty. Now we're going to go take a look at the art. So, uh, much like the literature, during the Tai Ching era, artwork flourished, uh, with uh, even emperors commissioning artwork, such as the Qianlong Emperor, who commissioned him, uh, a painting of himself as Manju Shri, the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, in the 1740s CE, uh, as well as other paintings, such as the floral painting of uh, titled Long Shining that was published in 1723 CE. Uh, there were also uh, landscape paintings that were made during this time, beautiful landscape paintings, especially the one on the right, uh, such as the Gong Jian, which was painted in 1684 CE, and again the one on the right, the 100 Horses, that was painted in 1728 CE. In fact, this is actually only a section of the 100 Horses. It was a much larger painting that I could not fit into this. But it wasn't just paintings. It was also uh, lacquer work and porcelain artwork that was produced during this point in time. Beautiful lacquer work and porcelain work for that matter uh, that you can see here with a lacquer, I want to say, uh, powder box on the left and of course a porcelain boss on the right. Now it's time to go to religion, to look at religion of the Qing Dynasty, because religion is one of the most important aspects uh, to look at for most empires throughout history. Not all, but religion, because religion is usually, is almost always a prominent driving factor in one form or the other, it's always important to look at. So, Due to its very diverse nature, culturally, very diverse cultural nature, the Qing Dynasty, of course, had a diverse number of religions within it, with, um, for the Mongols and the Manchus, one of the most prominent being uh, the, uh, the two on the left, being their native shamanism uh, and Buddhism. Buddhism, in fact, being, being at this point in time and, and still to this day, the largest religion in East Asia. But there were also other religions in China, such as Taoism, which was one of the most powerful uh, native uh, Chinese religions and philosophies. You, and also, despite the brutal uh, persecution of them, uh, Qing Dynasty China also had Christians and Muslims with them within it as well. <clears throat> and again, due to its very diverse nature, and due to it being a very diverse uh, empire, there was a, a diverse number of deities who were venerated within it, with, uh, of course, in the Jade Emperor being one of the most popular uh, deities venerated by the uh, royal court, but then you also had deities who were popular with the lower classes, such as Guan Yin, the Bodhisattva of Mercy, who is incredibly popular amongst women. Uh, and then you, of course, had deities such as Guan Di slash Guan Yu. It depends on who you ask. I've heard him called both, who is uh, a war deity, specifically a war deity venerated for, his, for heroism and valor, 
uh, and for honor, and he was incredibly popular, of course, among men and among the military and among police forces. And then, of course, you had household deities who were venerated as well. You had Zhao Jin, the kitchen god, who was particularly popular among men and lower class Qing households. Uh, and then you had two uh, goddesses who were popular in lower class women, how uh, Qing women households, um, uh, such as the toilet goddess Zi Gu and the goddess of weaving Xin Nu, both of which were incredibly popular among women, uh, though not quite as popular as Guan Yin. And then, of course, he had other go uh, other gods and goddesses, such as Ma Gu, the goddess of longevity, uh, Wen Shang, the god of literature, incredibly popular, <clears throat> incredibly popular among the Han, sorry, among the Qing literati uh, and aristocrats, as well as dozens uh, of dragon gods who were viewed as the ones who held uh, sway over seas, rivers, and lakes, uh, and also held sway over the weather, and they were all incredibly powerful in their own right, and there are, in fact, were and still are various ceremonies to honor these dragon deities in China to this day. Now uh, that we've looked at the, the uh, cultural flowering of the Qing dynasty uh, in the art, literature, and religion, we now have to go back to the social aspect, and that is the agriculture, uh, agricultural practices of the Qing Dynasty, as well as how the Qing Dynasty dealt with famine, how they relieved famine during their during the High Qing era. So, first off, it's important to note that with the conclusion of uh, the conquests by uh, the Qianlong Emperor. Uh, as well as before, even with the conclusion of earlier conquests by uh, Yongzhen and Kangzi, uh, and Shunzi, uh, Kangzi's father, uh, the Qing Dynasty gained a massive amount of territory and new farmland, uh, and you can see the numbers here. With, with there being like a regional total of like six hundred, uh, sorry, six million. Li, or uh, I'm not sure exactly how many mile, square miles that is, but it's a massive amount of land, which, of course, they use to produce farmland. Uh, and you can see sort of like the estimation of grain outputs in the millions with uh, where, uh, say, uh, there were uh, the output of the uh, see during the 1750s, the population of the Qing Dynasty was around 270, 270 million, uh, and the output of a single uh, uh, <laughs> patty could be say 550 caddies, and then you know expand upon that. Uh, and agriculture was divided via geographic region, with uh, with crops such as tea and rice being generally grown in the south, and crops such as millet grown in the north. Though, it's also important to note, crops from the Americas, from the New World, thanks to, this, uh, thanks to the global trade that was going on at the time, were also being cultivated in the Americas as well. These crops included things such as corn, which you can see evidence of uh, being present in China uh, in this <clears throat> in the snuff bottle, which was a uh, for uh, smelling and inhaling tobacco uh, from the Qing Dynasty. Which also brings me to tobacco. Tobacco was cultivated as a cash crop uh, by the Qing Dynasty at the time, as well as cotton. And then they also cultivated sweet potatoes during this period of time as well. In fact, you can sort of see the uh, distribution and introduction of sweet potato and corn into China uh, in these graphs here, like when they were introduced and how much was produced, etc., etc. And they were produced quite a lot uh, during this period of time. Uh, cotton, of course, can't be eaten, but it became incredibly popular in, uh, to be used in weaving. 
So, of course, the men and women who were farmers would harvest the cotton, uh, who would then, uh, with the women then taking the cotton to be used in weaving uh, textiles for personal use as well as for sale at markets. Uh, and, of course, this uh, production, this large-scale production of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of pounds of agricultural product came in handy when th disasters such as famine appeared. In fact, you can see on these graphs like how much uh, could be used at any given time or how much was used during famines at any given time to relieve uh, peasant families during these famines. And the Qing Dynasty was actually very good at doing that because they established uh, several large regional granaries, and each county had to have its own granary, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in order to to store this food for events such as this. Now we move on to uh, the next social aspect: uh, trade and commerce, because. Uh, there had to be a way for the Qing dynasty to, dynasty to get these new crops such as corn, cotton, sweet potato, and tobacco. And of course, that was from trade. So, in line with what I mentioned earlier in the video with how the Qing dynasty had a very well-developed navy, uh, the Qing dynasty also had a very well-developed well trade route. They had actually actually had a variety of different routes that were in use at any given point in time. And you can see here, like, Route 1 comes from Taiwan to the mainland. Uh, you know, Route 2 goes from uh, Macau to Fujian. To Fujian, to Fujian. Uh, route 3 from Fujian to Ningbo, etc., etc. Um, so each little trade route was connected. Neither one worked alone. They all worked in conjunction. And each port uh, had its own specific trading goods uh, with uh, Fujian and Taiwan uh, generally uh, specializing in things like uh, processed goods such as rice, oil, and sugar, and deer products, while other ports such as uh, Guangdong would focus on things like sugar products, pine, cotton, cotton cloth, bean dough, uh, local silks, etc. Um, and they could bring in quite a lot of product into each of these ports. And of course, this was not just, this trade was not just centered locally, <clears throat> it was global, with uh, several ports being connected to, uh, to various European or Euro-American nations, such as, of course, America, the U.S., uh, Russia, the United Kingdom, and Portugal, that you can see here on the map. Uh, with China generally exporting things like porcelain, tea, and silks, while they would import things like uh, European, uh, specifically British, uh, stopwatches and clocks, uh, cotton and wool cloth, of course, cotton, just raw cotton, raw tobacco, uh, tobacco containers, uh, though it's important to note that snuff bottles, like the one I showed that was in the shape of a corn cob, are a Chinese invention, and the most destructive of <laughs> these imports, uh, opium, which we'll talk about in the next video on the Qing Dynasty, where we talk about the opium war. Uh, in fact, to control this trade, uh, China had various different custom houses in each port to uh, organize and to keep track of what goods went in and went out of China. You know, you had main custom house, uh, you had the main custom houses, you had custom stations, and of course inspection stations to make sure that there's no smuggling uh, or other illegal activities going on. Now, of course. This didn't work perfectly, and eventually corruption would get the better of, of these custom houses, but they did work well for quite a while.
now uh, we need to take a look at something that I alluded to earlier in the video. How uh, actually several times in the video, how this, how the Qing Empire was a multi-ethnic empire. So, China, both during the Qing Dynasty, uh, as well as the Ming Dynasty and Tang and Song Dynasties, and as well as today, uh, is incredibly diverse culturally and ethnically. Now, of course, the largest ethnic group is that of the Mandarin or Han Chinese ethnic group, uh, with other ethnic groups such as Mongols and uh, Jurchens slash Manchus and Tibetans coming in pretty close, but you also had other groups like uh, Uyghurs, who are also pretty large, also a pretty large ethnic group. Uh, but Uyghurs, you had Miao, you had uh, the Tonka uh, or the Don uh, ethnic groups. You had uh, the various UA uh, or Cantonese speaking ethnic groups, as, as well as the Hakka. So. The first group I want to look at, and I want to preface this by saying that because, as you can see here, there are so many ethnic groups <laughs> present in China uh, during the Qing Dynasty and in modern day, I cannot even remotely cover them all in a single video. So I apologize to any members of any uh, ethnic groups that I don't mention in this video. I would love to talk about you in later videos, but right now for this video, uh, I have to sort of narrow it down to only a few. So the first I want to talk about are the Tonka or Don peoples, who are uh, groups of peoples uh, who are general, who one are, are located mainly around the Guangdong province. And generally, that's where uh, where they uh, tend to live, and they are. Uh, thought to have most likely be, be descended from the various UA or non-UA or by UA, depending on how what you want to call it, uh, ethnic groups uh, of southern China, with the by UA uh, being the general term for all of them, having been uh, conquered uh, pretty early on by the Qing and Han dynasties in the uh, 200s and 100s BCE. And the uh, the Tonka and Don, the Tonka slash Don people are well known and more well known then as being incredibly skilled sailors whose primary means of economic uh, production was that of fishing, as you can see here on the left. Though they would also uh, peddle their wares as merchants in various ports, also. But these were not the only professions that they uh, that they specialized in. They were also well known for their connection with flower boat brothels. And this is because there's, while they were predominantly farmers, uh, sorry, farmers, so while they were pre predominantly fishers and merchants, they would often have to find other ways to, uh, to feed their families. And one of the best ways to do this during this time, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with in the section on women, is uh, brothels. And they could actually make a pretty big killing off of these brothels. Uh, and here's sort of an image of smaller brothels. I mean, obviously these are bigger brothels here, uh, but they could range from inside from large size, inside from large to small, as you can see here. But also, it wasn't just connection with brothel, uh, brothels. One of the other most common professions uh, that the Tonka that the Don people uh, participated in was that of piracy. In fact, piracy was seen as an escape from uh, social strife and the strict social uh, structure of the Qing Dynasty by a lot of South China populations, not just the Tonka Don people. Now we look at uh, one of the uh, one of the largest South Chinese population groups, the Hakka peoples. So the Hakka peoples are generally located in uh, the Ganzhou region that you see here, also Guangzhou, and they are most likely the descendants of various different groups of migrations of Han Chinese into the south of what is now modern-day modern China over the course of uh, 
around 2000, maybe 1500 years. First starting during the, uh, possibly during the fall of the Han Dynasty, as well as during the nor period of the Northern Dynasties, Northern and Southern Dynasties. Uh, and then again, migrating a little further south during the fall of the Tang Dynasty, and then even further south during the fall of the um, Song Dynasty, as well as the start of the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongol Empire, and then going on and on until they eventually we, uh, reach Guangdong. Uh, and they are very well known for a variety of different things. One, they're well known for building very well designed and fortified villages, like you see here. Uh, they're actually called uh, fortified villages, that's simply what they are. Um, and they could, were designed in shapes of circles and squares, and they could house hundreds, if not thousands, of people within them. And the Hakka people uh, were predominantly agri... Well, they had a variety of jobs they did. They were uh, agriculturalists, of course. They, they farmed things like cotton, tobacco, uh, and rice. They were also in the forestry industry. They sold, uh, chopped down and sold timber. But they were also well known as incredibly hard workers uh, because some of the other professions that they went to into were things like mining, uh, especially when uh, uh, when uh, farmland became less available. Uh, Hakka men would go into mining professions, go into the mountains to mine ore like silver and zinc and various other metals like that. Uh, or uh, one of the most common professions that the Hakka men would go into would be that of the military. In fact, the Hakka, uh, Hakka men would be present in the Qing military and even uh, Chinese military to this day in large numbers. They participated in things like the, uh, the White Lotus Rebellion, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, the Taiping Uprising, uh, the, uh, the revolution against the Qing Dynasty, uh, the Hakka soldiers were present in high numbers in both the uh, communist and republican Chinese armies. Uh, they are very well known for being very skilled fighters. In, including, they're very well known for their for being very skilled martial artists. In fact, there is are several martial arts that are famous for being uh, created by the Hakka people, such as the Southern Praying Mantis style that you can see here. Now we're going to take a look at the Uyghur peoples that you see here. So the Uyghur peoples were a group of peoples, a Turkic, a group of Turkic speaking peoples who were uh, annexed into the Qing dynasty when they conquered Xinjiang from the Zungar Hanate. And the Uyghurs had actually been present in that region of what is now modern-day China, uh, Central Asia, for uh, centuries, actually creating their own powerful nation-state confederation, the Uyghur, Khan, uh, the Uyghur Hanate, uh, in around 740 CE. And so they had already been there for several centuries before the Qing Dynasty annexed the region into uh, their new empire. And they were, during the medieval period and to this day, very skilled horsemen. I mean, after all, most people in the Central, Central Eurasian and East Asian steppe, like the Mongols and uh, the Manchus and such, were incredibly skilled horsemen and horse archers. Now, of course, in the modern day and then during most of the Qing Dynasty, the Uyghurs were uh, generally subsistence farmers, farming things like millet and things like that. Though it is also important to note, while I'm not going to cover it in depth in this video, that uh, in the modern day, uh, the Uyghur people are also suffering a cultural uh, genocide at the hand of the Chinese government and are now being oftentimes forced, as in this picture, into uh, labor slavery. Forced labor. Uh, so I do want to bring that up just briefly to explain this picture uh, but it's still also a good picture to show that uh, for the last couple hundred years the Uyghurs have generally been uh, farmers rather than nomads and the Uyghurs are also predominantly like 99 percent 
Muslim. Uh, they worship, they practice a religion of Islam and have actually pretty much since the like thousands, 900 CE. Now we're going to come to the last group of people we're going to look at in this video, and that is the Meow peoples that you see here. Uh, and they are located generally in this region here. Uh, and the Meow, uh, or the Hmong, um, they're, they're, they can be called both, in fact. Uh, so there are some divisions that just call themselves Meow and some divisions, some divisions that call themselves Hmong. Uh, <clears throat> but the Hmong Meow uh, have oral histories that talk about their migration into this region of southern China uh, way back in the Bronze Age and the Neolithic period of China. And you can see the sort of oral history map right here. And this is actually backed up by both, at least to some degree, both by archaeology and archaeogenetics, uh, with the Miao Hmong people being connected to the Dakshi culture as well as the Longshan and Yang Shao cultures. In fact, the archaeological evidence and uh, the archaeological, linguistic, and genetic evidence suggests that around uh, three to two thousand years ago, the Yang Shao peoples began to migrate into South China and began to intermarry with already present uh, populations in South China. And you can see sort of this hypothesis here uh, in this graph here. And you can pause to sort of read to get a better scope, but it just it sort of shows the timeline and percentages and uh, makeup of what happened. And generally, uh, for most of their history and into the current day, the Meow people uh, are subsistence farmers, mainly focusing on rice farming, as you see here. Uh, but they are also well known, especially through the Ming Dynasty uh, and the Qing Dynasty, for their constant rebellions against Chinese authority. Because uh, at, at the onset of the Mongol, uh, Ming, and Qing Dynasties, as well as other dynasties, Han Chinese imperial power began to encroach on traditional Miao homelands, and so uh, they didn't like that and often chafed under uh, Chinese imperial rule, and so they would often rebel. Uh, they would re rebel several times in the Ming Dynasty alone. <laughs> Which actually brings me to the reign of Qianlong's successor, Jia Qing, who reigned from 1796 to 1820 CE. So in 1796, Long would actually abdicate the throne uh, for his son, Jia Qing. And he claimed that this is because he did not want to rule longer than his grandfather, Kong Zi. However, while he abdicated, uh, on paper, Jia Qing was the ruler. In practice, Qian Long still held most of the authority and still sort of bullied Jia Qing into doing what he wanted and ruling how he wanted. And in fact, this sort of uh, <clears throat> this micromanaging that Qian Long did to his son uh, backfired uh, in the uh, backfired by uh, creating and starting, igniting, however you want to call it two different rebellions at once. First, the Miao Rebellion, which again was started because the Miao began to chafe under uh, Qing rule. Um, they didn't like being ruled by, or even Chinese rule, they didn't like being ruled by uh, a foreign power, so they rebelled uh, and the fighting was brutal and lasted for around uh, you know, for around 10 years, actually. And here's another uh, one of the battles that you see here. And then the second, and actually the larger of the two rebellions, was the White Lotus Rebellion. Which was uh, started when a millenarian group uh, called the White Lotus Sect uh, began to sort of gain prominence in South China. Uh, and, and to explain a millenarian group is like, oh, you know, it's it's... The, the end is nigh, let's put a new ruler 
in charge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And actually, while it was gaining power, uh, it had it actually had no plans. The leadership of the White Lotus sect had no plans to start <laughs> a rebellion at all. But Qian Long suspected suspected them of a rebellion, so he sent military forces against the White Lotus sect, and the White Lotus sect responded by rising up in rebellion, starting this rebellion, um, which was a, quite the blunder on, <laughs> on Qian Lung's part. And the rebellion also would last about 10 years and would, fade, would see the White Lotus sect defeat several Qing armies in battle. It was a, de a massive debacle, and it was a failure... Uh, a resounding failure on all ends. And in fact, it looked like the rebellion might succeed at some point. <clears throat> uh, and, the, and as I said, the fighting was incredibly br brutal and hard fought, like, in, like you can see here, uh, as well as here. However, eventually Chen Lung would die, uh, and the with his death, Jia Qing would sort of remove all of the yes men that Qian Long had put in charge of the White Lotus suppression of this rebellion, and would put into place recent graduates from uh, the uh, the Yulu Academy, such as General Yan Ru Yi, who would take over the suppression of the of the White Lotus rebellion in 1800 CE. And he would then proceed to, along with other uh, Qing generals, talented generals who had graduated from this uh, from this academy, he would proceed to enact scorched warfare, and he would do it in brutal fashion, burning down entire White Lotus villages, slaughtering entire armies, etc., etc. And most importantly, he would actually report his failures, because one of the setbacks, one of the issues with the Qianlong Emperor's uh, yes men. Uh, leading the suppression of the White Lotus Rebellion, is they would not actually uh, report their failures. They would actually be like, yeah, we won this battle while actually having lost it horribly. And so Yan Ru Yi and his other uh, fellow commanders would actually be like, no, we lost this battle, it was a setback, but we'll do better next time. And so there was actually an accurate picture of what was going on, because if you don't have an accurate picture, you can't know, it's like, well, they lost this battle, maybe I need to send reinforcements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And so Yan Ru Yi, as he began to do this, actually began to have the right amount of soldiers. Uh, like, I lost a battle, I need more men. And with that, as well as the scorched warfare, he would eventually be able to put down this rebellion. Finally. However, that would not be the end of uh, Jia Qing's uh, problems. Uh, that would actually come with... Uh, uh, after the pirate queen Jing Yi Sao and her confederation were dealt with. So, as a result of the widespread destruction of the White Lotus Rebellion, as well as uh, large numbers of South Chinese uh, individuals just simply turning to piracy because it was more profitable, uh, piracy began to rise in the South China Sea. Uh, and this happened for a variety of reasons. One, again, because it was more profitable for South China citizens, but also because this warfare from uh, the White Lotus Rebellion began to destroy farmland. And this destruction of farmland, even after the rebellion was put down, would actually continue well into the 1810s, as you can see here on the left. And then on top of that, because of these aforementioned rebellions, uh, many of the garrisons on the South China coast began to become uh, dangerously under, uh, under garrisoned. There were not enough men in each garrison to deal with the threat of piracy. There were not enough naval, uh, not enough people in naval forts and ports and such to deal with the piracy because they were having to deal with these two large-scale rebellions. So, of course, this was a breeding ground for pirate activity. And in this environment rose several skilled pirate warlords, such as Xing Yi, whom you see here, whom would participate and both would whom would both heavily raid the China coast and would also participate in as mercenaries in uh, civil wars and thing in areas like Dai Viet. <laughs> But most, but the most important for this video is Xing Yi would eventually lead a raid on a village, the village home of 
the individual, the woman who would eventually become known as Zing Yi Sao. Uh, and it's most likely that she was a member of the Tonka Don community. She was probably a member of the boat people. Uh, because pretty soon after her capture, she would eventually realize there was no going back to her old life. Uh, and she would marry Zing Yi and actually become his uh, partner in crime. Uh, and eventually, with Zing Yi's death in one of these uh, civil wars that he was working as a mercenary in, uh, Zing Yi Sao would take control of his pirate fleet. Uh, and while doing so, she would marry, uh, remarry uh, one of Zing Yi's lieutenants, Ching Po Sai. And together, Zing Yi Sao, who was the brains behind the operation, uh, while Ching Po Sai was sort of the front man. In fact, if to this day, if you, you uh, ask about pirates in uh, South China, uh, from my understanding, Ching Po Sai is the most fa is the more famous one, despite Zing Yi Sao being the brains behind the operation. Because of course, Chinese society uh, at the time only cared more about men. Anyways, uh, but together they would create a powerful pirate confederation. Seen here. Uh, and then they would, with this confederation, would begin ra uh, ravaging the South China coast, burning hundreds of villages, taking a lot of loot, taking a lot of prisoners, many of which actually eventually joined her pirate fleet. Uh, and sh uh, she would also, uh, Qin Cheng Posai, uh, would actually win several victories against the Qing Navy because at this point in time, they were actually more advanced and more organized than the Qing Navy because the Qing Navy was now heavily overfunded, heavily undermanned due to funding being reallocated towards re rebuilding from the Miao and White Turban Rebellions. Uh, but eventually, she and uh, Cheng Po Sai would lose, uh, would be defeated at the Battle of the Tiger's Mouth uh, in a naval battle against both the British and Portuguese Navy. And after this loss, uh, Zing Yi Sao and uh, Cheng Po Sai would actually surrender to the Qing government, and the Qing government, because they needed uh, skilled sailors and skilled naval commanders would actually hire her as a privateer or a pirate for hire. And so she and Chunk Po Sai for a couple years would actually go around hunting other pirates and putting the, and destroying their fleets. Uh, gaining basically fleecing the Qing government for as much money as they could. And then eventually, in the 1810s, like 1811, 1812, they would settle down in Foshan uh, and would uh, basically just retire. They would, mar they would stay married, they would have several children, and eventually they would both die of old age. But at this point in time, despite uh, the, these rebellions having been put down and Zing Yi Sao finally being defeated, uh, and essentially retiring, the damage had already been done. China was now incredibly weakened from multiple rebellions. It was incredibly weakened from decades of war under the Qianlong's reign, and it was incredibly weakened from the destruction that Qing Yi Sao's pirate confederation caused. Uh, and it was now heavily underfunded. Be the military and navy of the Qing dynasty was now heavily underfunded because of these. And so this meant that there was a storm coming. That this that this essentially meant that this final conclusion of conflicts uh, was simply just the calm before the storm, because while the Qing Dynasty was being weakened from internal strife uh, and constant warfare, the British Empire was on the rise. But that is a subject for the next video on the Qing Dynasty. Uh, talking about the Opium Wars and the Taiping Uprising. And here's a picture of the British fleet, as you see here. Okay, so with that, that concludes this video. Um, I know it was a long video, and I hope, despite that, that you enjoyed uh, the video, that you enjoyed the video, and that you learned a few things. 
If you want to see me cover any of the subjects that I talked about in this video in greater detail in other videos, feel free to leave a comment in the comment sections. And remember to like, share, and subscribe. And you all have a good day.